Good afternoon, welcome, and thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, You Think You Want to Be a Consultant. I'm Lori from HIS Talk, and I'll be monitoring. Our speaker today is Frank Poggio. Frank is founder and CEO of the Kelzon Group, a consulting firm that focuses on health information systems issues. He has over 45 years of experience in healthcare industry in a variety of roles, including hospital CIO, and CFO, software entrepreneur, and industry consultant. He's worked for both large and small consulting firms and has started several firms himself that were later acquired by larger firms. His vast and diverse experience makes him an expert on consulting in the healthcare IT industry. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Frank. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, Glad you could take the time to tune in. Uh, before I get started, let me simply say that uh, I had a little dental work done this morning, so my uh, Novocaine is kind of half worn off, so if I stumble over some words, uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, what we're going to cover in the next 40, 45 minutes or so uh, is these particular items, why, why become a consultant, the pros and cons of consulting, talk about different kinds of consulting firms, what makes for a, sec a successful consultant, uh, uh, the challenge in, in selling consulting, we're going to talk about that for a while, attributes of successful consultants, and then we're going to wrap it up with a, what I call a self-assessment of questions that uh, help you, will hopefully help you uh, decide whether it's really for you or not, whether consulting is uh, uh, what you really want to do. So here we go. Why do you want to be a consultant? When I talk with folks um, in, in this industry as well as other industries and uh, get into this, this discussion, this, this is what I generally hear. Uh, something like, uh, the current job has been too long and too frustrating. I'm tired of getting boring assignments. Uh, I never get enough resources. Uh, they keep shifting my due dates and the priorities. Uh, nobody is hiring now. I'm, I've been looking for a better job, better position can't find one, so maybe I'll go into consulting. Uh, or maybe I got a great opportunity, but I can't move out of state, so uh, I've got to stay. I can't move, so I'm, I'm going to find work uh, in consulting in my current locale. Uh, and then, of course, you get the milieu of, I hate my boss. Uh, I don't like my coworkers. It's a terrible commute. The pay isn't enough, and on and on and on and on. Reality is, these are all the wrong reasons to go into consulting. If this is what's driving you, uh, you might want to tune out now because uh, it ain't going to work. However, <clears throat> maybe somebody says this to you. Uh, I don't know that you really want to proceed on that basis, but there are good reasons to be to go into to be or to go into consultant, I'm I'm going to be approaching this uh, from multiple angles. So the situation where uh, you're going to start your own firm, maybe, uh, or maybe you're going to go work for a, a big firm or some other firm. Uh, those are all op opportunities that might work. But uh, typically, the right reasons look like this: you're recruited by an established firm, then obviously that established firm sees something in you uh, as a fit. In, into consulting, and that's obviously a good sign. Uh, maybe you have some expertise that's in demand, um, security issues, um, blockchain, things like that. Uh, or you like and want change in assignments and environments, that's something you're looking for. Uh, you enjoy risk, uh, and note I use the word enjoy, not tolerate risk or not like risk, you enjoy risk, and that is uh, a key issue. Maybe you want more control of your life and your work and so on. You like business travel. Uh, and lastly, a good reason to go into consulting is you have a fallback plan. Uh, a fallback plan means that if the consulting stuff doesn't work out, you got something else to go to. And that's important from the standpoint of minimizing the risk. Uh, managing your risk. If you don't have a fallback plan of some kind, uh, as you proceed into this, uh, your anxiety and your stress, obviously, are going to maybe overwhelm you. Now, 
let's talk about some of the pros and consultant uh, pros and cons of consulting. Uh, the classic one you hear is you call the shots, you're your own boss. And of course, there is a potential for higher income. Now, on the off side of that, uh, reality is your customer is your boss. And in fact, if you've got two or three clients, you have two or three bosses. And that high income potential is real, but it's also a high risk income. And we'll get into a little bit of that later. <clears throat> More pros, you work when you want to, and you work how you want to. And it's relatively low cost of entry into consulting. There's no big capital investment, at least in terms of equipment or anything of that sort, particularly today. On the off side, the customer demands your time and place. So you can work when you want, but you better be doing it pretty much when your customer uh, needs you to do it. And about that low cost of entry, uh, there's no big capital investment, but the reality is there's lost salary, um, personal time you're going to have to put in. There's potentially travel costs and, and just trying to generate business and so on. So those are real investments uh, as well. More pros, you control the sales. There's no unrealistic promises. You, many times you'll hear people say, particularly if you're in the IT development world, working for a software company or uh, some technology company that the sales guys went out and they sold this thing and now we got to figure out how the heck to build it. Uh, and you don't like that, uh, and rightfully so. And then, of course, uh, consulting is not boring. There are many things, changes, uh, activities that you get involved with. On the negative side, well, the sales guy isn't making the sale, but now you've got to make the sale. Um, so, you know, the question is, how do you do that? Can you do that? Do you like doing that? And as for, as for not being boring, that's true, but it, consulting can be unpredictable hours and unpredictable projects. You know, you might come across a project that you're not too crazy about, but on the other hand, you got to put food on the table, so you take the project anyway. Other benefits? you define your benefit package it's nice uh and there's no interruptions typically you can stay focused when you need to be focused the negative side is you pay for all those benefits uh, <clears throat> whatever you want for benefits you can have but you got to get your checkbook out and as far as the interruptions and being focused as an advantage the offside of that is you have no support system, a little support system, particularly if you go in as an independent. Uh, you have no uh, you have no co-workers necessarily giving you the uh, ongoing morale boosters or the attaboys and so on. So, uh, you know, that's uh, something you're going to have to deal with as being a consultant. So that's kind of a synopsis of uh, the pros and cons. Now, let's talk about the types of consulting. Uh, at the highest level, we have organizational consulting, strategy, acquisitions, business development, big federal government projects, and so on. Uh, this is more um, general uh, business strategy and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you have industry consulting, where you're dealing within an industry, dealing with perhaps regulatory issues, technical in issues uh, specific to that industry, maybe mergers and acquisitions specific to that industry, um, perhaps not at an extremely large level, uh, but nonetheless uh, at a level uh, for the size of organization that you're working with. And then perhaps there's local government consulting that you would do um, specific areas within the local government uh, related to that industry. The area where you find the most consulting is in the technical area where you have specific uh, problem solving going on that deal with perhaps things like IT security, operating systems, um, communication systems, hardware, database, uh, blockchain, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> or maybe you're a product expert and uh, you're focused on finance or clinical systems. You're a pharmacist, for example. Uh, your uh, excuse me, 
uh, a lab manager, whatever. Supply chain is another area, compliance, marketing, and so on and so forth. So those those are basically the waterfront of uh, types of consulting and what goes on in each. Now the important point basically is the degree of difficulty in doing those levels of consulting uh, goes up as you move from technical industry to general. Uh, degree of difficulty not only in doing those projects but getting clients in those areas uh, but the offset is if you're looking for the highest billing rate uh, the general level is where you'll find the five hundred dollar eight hundred dollar an hour consultants and uh, the lower dollars will be down in the technical areas so what kind of firms do we have in consulting well you got the big national and international firms uh, typically you want to refer to as the big four CPA firms, Deloitte, Price, uh, KPMG, E&Y, do a ton of consulting, obviously, as many cases, spinoffs of their audits. Uh, then you have firms such as A-Center, Booz Allen, Boston Consulting, A.D. Little, uh, McKinsey, uh, Capgemini, uh, IBM, and so on, uh, as your international and national firms, then you have a whole slew of middle-sized, mid-sized companies. And in healthcare, that could be uh, folks like Lidos, Huntsinger, uh, Cumberland, uh, CTG, Impact Advisors, and, and so on down the list, Euron Consulting, uh, the Iatric, uh, and what have you. Actually, if you go to the HIS Talk website and um, look up their vendor list and whatnot and just pick out the uh, consulting category. Last time I looked, which was a few days ago, there was 181 firms that were involved in healthcare consulting, healthcare IT consulting, in one form, fashion, or another. Now, a number of those firms are vendors, uh, vendors who sell systems and then uh, sell consulting after it, uh, trying to teach you how to better use their system, perhaps, or solve other kinds of problems. Uh, of course, you also have uh, the firms that, that do the facility management and so on. Then you have a whole bunch of small firms uh, that are typically local and perhaps even national with a specific technical focus. In that situation, the small firm, essentially, if they're dedicated to healthcare, particularly healthcare IT, uh, are going to be national because there just aren't that many clients uh, in a small locale. A state, for example, that would necessarily keep that firm going. So they tend to reach out across state lines uh, and, uh, you know, keep to their specific technical focus. And of course, we have startups, uh, which tend to be very local, very functional, uh, with a very technical focus. Uh, <clears throat> and that's obviously the one person firm, maybe the two person firm. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Then you have an area called federations, which is a loose combine of small firms with an industry focus tend to be cross-functional. In that situation are two or three um, startups or independents might get together and one person covers uh, the clinical area, another person covers a certain area of IT, another person covers uh, maybe finance, and they, they agree to work together in a loose contract arrangement uh, under you typically, uh, they're structured as LLCs, limited liability corporations. Um, and uh, so if one gets the contract, uh, say the IT person gets the contract and they need help with a uh, specific area of pharmacy, for example, or uh, finance, he brings in one of his other uh, partners, if you will, independents, and they can either choose to work together or choose not to, as the case might be. Last comment I want to make on that is gigs and body shops, in my book, are not consulting firms. So you have companies like uh, Capgemini, Kata, Infosys, and so on, which are primarily body shops. They will do some consulting. Uh, they refer to themselves as consultants. Uh, but in my book, they're basically body shops. And in the same vein, if uh, you pick up a gig, a quick little consulting uh, project uh, you know, from the hospital across the road, uh, you know, you know, for I guess for a week or so, you might 
because you consider yourself a consultant, but uh, that's really not what we're talking about here. Moving on, what's your primary roles as a consultant? You have four roles. Those roles, quite simply, are you got to trap them, you got to skin them, you got to cook them, and you got to clean them up. And in reality, what that is, is if you're a small firm or a startup firm, you got to sell them, trapping them. You got to scope the design and manage the project for the client. That's your job. You got to cook them, which basically is complete, do the project, deliver the deliverables, and you got to clean up. And the clean up is get the bill out and collect the money. So there are four major roles. And if you're going to go into a very small firm or start your own firm, you have to uh, think about these roles and how you're going to play them. Um, obviously, you can subcontract out maybe the billing and collections and whatnot, but the reality is if you're a small startup, it's going to be extremely difficult to uh, outsource, so to speak, the selling and, and scoping and doing the project. So in that vein, since those roles are required, if we look at a medium-sized firm, the Selling role is typically done by a partner or a vice president or somebody of, of that caliber of that level uh, title. Scoping, the designing the project, managing the project is probably you. Uh, doing the project is probably you. In the cleanup, uh, they typically have in a medium sized firm uh, support staff. So if you're not big on the cleanup and you're not big on the selling uh, and you want to go into consulting, um, perhaps a medium firm is, is the place you ought to be looking. <clears throat> On the large scale firm, that big international national firm that we talked about, uh, the selling is typically done again by a partner or a director level person. The scoping of the project or design and managing of the project is done by a uh, project manager or director level person, uh, usually a one or two below that partner level. The actual doing of the project is most likely you, and the cleanup, again, is done by the support staff. So if you are an individual with a really good technical knowledge of uh, blockchain or something of that sort, uh, pharmacy, whatever it might be, uh, you might want, and you're not big on, on again, the selling and the uh, general project management, uh, you may want to look at a large firm as a place to go. What do consultants do? Well, in a simple sense, assessments and analysis, they give advice, they make recommendations, they, they can do highly specialized work, obviously. A lot of them do implementation these days uh, after an organization acquires a uh, EMR from Epic, Cerner, uh, Athena, whoever it might be, uh, they might facilitate the implementation. There's a lot of that work that gets done. But most importantly, consultants, real consultants, identify problems that are real problems or latent or potential problems. So I'm in there working on Project X, but one of the things I want to be doing is looking at what other problems might this organization have, this department, whatever, uh, that I could help on. And the reason why that's important and why you want to do it is because that's how you sell more consulting. Uh, you have to be able to uh, identify uh, and describe, obviously, problems, mostly potential problems. Many clients that you'll deal with say, I know what my problem is, I need somebody to do X. Okay, that's fine, assuming you agree with them. Uh, but what many clients don't realize is there's potential problems coming down the road. A good example, uh, quite simply, is regulatory issues. Uh, if you're aware of what's going on regulatory-wise, then there may be potential problems that that client is not, at that point, aware of. Critical components of successful consultants. There are four key elements to successful consultants. 
First is skills and competencies. Obviously, you have to have a certain level of competency and skill in a given area or two. Uh, if it's IT, maybe it's security. Uh, if it's a clinical area, maybe it's something to do with uh, nursing or some medical protocols, or whatever it might be. Uh, you also need good people and communication skills. Uh, obviously, uh, communication is a very important part of consulting, uh, and you have to have those skills. If you if you're not comfortable doing presentations and uh, even talking to small groups, one on one, whatever, uh, you're going to have some problems. The third area is a thing called situation knowledge. And situation knowledge is what do you know about the industry? What do you know about the prospective client? Uh, what kinds of problems are typical in this either functional area or this industry or this type of organization, whatever it might be? Situation knowledge doesn't come easy. Situation knowledge, for the most part, comes with time and experience. But you have to have a certain level of situation knowledge, situation knowledge and I will show you in a little bit why it's important and where you use it most. The last one is the selling skills. As I mentioned on the previous slide, selling your services or your organization services is very important. So you need a certain level of selling skills. Uh, and if you're a, uh, if you maybe when you're in college you sold used cars, that's that's okay, but that kind of selling skill isn't what you really need in the consulting world. What you need is a selling skill that deals with problems and solving of those problems. So, in a nutshell, if you're good at all four of these, you should be able to land projects and deliver perhaps the perfect project in many projects. But those are the four key elements that it takes to be successful in consulting. Consulting is a value sell more than anything else. People do not hire the cheapest consultant, the least expensive consultant. If they did, those big international firms wouldn't exist. Value is you are the hammer, and the nail is their problem. So in order for you to have value for the client, you need to either have identified or perhaps they've identified and qualified the problem and they in effect see you as a solution or I should say as a help in the solution and that becomes your value. Cases in consulting you might get fee pushback and, and uh, you know they don't like your billing rate or they tell you that uh, the guy on the other side of uh, the country is going to charge me half the rate. Well. Consulting is a value sell, and value is related to your utility over your price per hour. So what value do you bring to the client? Uh, quite simply, if you could look a client in the eye and say, I could save you a million dollars, but it's going to cost you, my fee is going to be 100000 would you hire that consultant? If you did your homework as a client and believe that, that in fact, they could, and there are ways to, to get to that belief, touch on a few examples in a minute, uh, why wouldn't you hire that consultant? Now, the client might say, well, how long is it going to take you to do this project? Take me a week. $100,000 for a week. Well, that's a heck of a billing rate. But you're going to save a million dollars, and maybe you even go further and say something like, I'll do it on a contingency basis. If I don't save you the million, you don't pay me 100000 would you take on that project as a consultant? Would you take it on as a client? Uh, if all factors are true, why wouldn't you? So consulting, primarily a value sell. So the first rule of consulting, if there's no problem, if you cannot identify uh, problems and or with your client, uh, either active problems, what I referred to earlier as latent problems, then there's no reason for a project, and there's no payday, if you will. So con consulting is value-driven, and value is driven by problem identification. How do you sell consulting? Here's a simple example. Here's one way 
to sell to something. Here's one way to, quote, prove that you can deliver uh, that million dollar savings, if you will. And it's typically referred to as a reference story. So you might say something like, I worked with the VP of clinical systems at Happy Healthcare, helped them implement the new version control system, reduced outages by 20% in the first year. Uh, well, that's okay. That sounds pretty nice, but it's not value driven enough. What you really want to be able to say is something like this. Happy Healthcare was experiencing new release failures of over 50%, wasting significant staff time and costs. So there's a problem. Okay. I reviewed their application portfolio, identified a better version control system, and directed its implementation. So that's what I did. Uh, this resulted in reducing update outages by 5% and say, or to 5% and saved over 400,000 a year in IT staff and user time. So there's the real value. That's the kind of uh, message, messaging story that you need to be able to deliver to prove your value. So that obviously came from some prior consulting work you might have done. Uh, and uh, you need as many of those value statements as you can possibly put together based upon your past experience in order to prove to that client that you not only can do the job, you can do it well, and you can deliver the goods. How do you identify client problems before or during your first call or meeting? Well, there's many ways to go about it, and here they are. Your network. I cannot overemphasize this. You must have a network of contacts through your professional associations, HIMSS, HFMA, CLMA, whatever it might be. You need that network because that network will be your feeder to your first level of problem identification. I should say client identification and problem identification beyond that. Then, of course, there are press releases, there are SEC reports for for-profit entities. You can do searches on Google and LinkedIn blogs and so on, general press releases, trade journals, regulatory reports, and so on. So in the example of press releases, if you're reading press releases and a uh, large, well, maybe not even a large, but even a mid-sized healthcare organization uh, says that they're acquiring uh, medical practices as part of their uh, overall strategy, uh, that's what you'd read in the press release, but reading between the lines, if you're a consultant that works in the uh, practice management arena, what that press release is telling you is that this organization may be having a problem with melding in those practices. And if that's your belly with, then that becomes a lead for you to make the contacts, and hopefully through your network, uh, to talk to these people as to what value you can bring to their situation um, of bringing in these, these medical practices. So, you know, as a simple example, if you were fortunate enough to meet this individual from the organization face-to-face uh, -face or over the phone, you might want to say something like, look, I read where you were acquiring six new practices. Uh, and my experience essentially uh, is uh, working with practices and bringing new practices in causes all kinds of operational, organizational kinds of problems. And, let me tell you how I've helped other folks, which takes me to the last element, which is how do you identify a problem? You can ask them. Nothing wrong with asking them, but what's more important is the way you ask them. You can't just simply say, Charlie, what's a bug in you? What kind of problems are you having today? Charlie might come back and say, well, I've been trying to land a rocket on Venus, and the thing keeps blowing up. How can you help me? Well, you just put yourself in a corner that you don't want to be in. So the way you ask them is that situation knowledge I talked about earlier. You use that situation knowledge. You, you say something like, well, in two or three of the other practices I worked in um, over the last year, uh, they were having a problem uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, keeping physicians or uh, expanding the practice, whatever it might be. Are you having any problems like that? So you give them a multiple choice question that is basically structured towards the things that you do well. And of course, uh, they might say, yeah, well, yeah, we, we 
we're trying to recruit more physicians, and, and that's been a struggle, and you go from there. Or maybe they say, well, no, we're not, we're not having any of those problems, in which case you, you know, dig into your kit bag and say, well, some of the other problems they're having are with meaningful use or maybe with uh, parking or something of that sort. Again, things that you've uh, done in the past that you know you can help with. And you could wind up in a situation just in a, a first face-to-face -face meeting or a phone call where they simply don't have any problems that you can relate to, in which case uh, you move on to the next prospect. Okay, we'll take a little sip of water here. Bumps in the road. What you need to be prepared for as you uh, build your practice or join a practice. Travel time and expenses. Uh, you know, if, it, if you have to fly or travel for three or four hours out to a client to, to do your work, and then you're going to have to fly three or four hours back home or wherever the next stop is, who's paying for that time? Uh, does anybody pay for that time? You know, and who's paying the expenses, particularly if you haven't got the consulting contract yet? You know, they want you to come out and talk to them, uh, get on an airplane, come tell us how great you are. Well, you're going to drop an easy thousand dollars, maybe two thousand, on the hotel you stay at, I guess. Or can you bear that cost? Later, no payments. You build a client, and you're not getting paid, uh, or they're taking forever to get paid. Meanwhile, you got to pay that that airplane bill, those travel expenses that you bill them for. So that can be a problem. Or no payments. They don't pay you. Why are they not paying you? Well, we can talk about that a little bit in terms of what might fail. But in any event, you got a financial problem if they're not paying you. Then you have a problem with scope scope creep, uh, which is fairly typical in technical consulting, uh, we're essentially, uh, well, the, the project was defined as A, B, and C, and now you're halfway into it, and uh, the client says, you know, we really ought to be doing D, too, and can you do D? And so now the question becomes, uh, do you add that to the project? Uh, do you uh, ask for more money, more time? Uh, are you willing to do it and sort of eat it? Uh, and how many times is this going to happen? And what do you do when you finally reach the end of the road and say, you know, we went from A, B, C to D, E, and F, and uh, we're going to stop this project and figure out what's going on here. That can be a difficult situation. And, of course, you always have competition. Uh, there's always competition, uh, particularly in consulting. As I said earlier, uh, is a relatively low cost to entry in consulting, so you will face competition at all levels. And as I said before, consulting is a value sell, and that, in my mind, is the way you need to deal with it. And the last one is an interesting problem that particularly pops up in technical kinds of consulting. It's what I call the brain pickers and the freebie leeches. And that's the situation where they bring you in and they're picking your brain. How would you solve this problem? What would you do? Can you be more specific? What about this? And they go on and on. Maybe they bring you in for two meetings, three meetings. Give me a detailed plan. Uh, and what they're after is, quote, a solution without paying for it. Uh, and you have to really be able to handle those situations. You have to uh, be confident enough to look him in the eye at some point and say, you know, the only asset I really have is my knowledge. And that's what I sell. So in so many words, if you want the answer, hire me as a consultant. There are other ways to deal with that, uh, one of which, which I'll get to in a second, um, is a technique that uh, if you're not familiar with, you may want to put in your kit bag. Okay. When should a consultant decline an engagement? Uh, I'm just going to hit a few of these. The customer is not ready to take off the rose-colored glasses. That basically means that the, the client believes you are the solution. You will solve their problem. The reality is you do not solve problems as a consultant. The client 
solves them on their own with your help. You give them the guidance, you give them the direction, and so on, but they have to solve the problem if they're not willing to do that. And that might mean they need to expend some resources or do other things. Uh, then that project most likely is uh, not going to be successful, highly unlikely. Uh, the customer stated goals, the committed resources are a mismatch, um, or maybe uh, you lack the skills. Obviously, if they need help in the financial area and that's not your forte, uh, you probably shouldn't be there. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, one of which is time. You just might be overbooked. And one of the nasty things about, particularly if you're an independent consultant, is taking on more work than you can handle, uh, you know, not being able to digest all that. Um, so you need to uh, really think through whether you're going to have the time to deal with that client. And the last one is consultant doesn't like the customer. Well, if you don't like the customer, then you really shouldn't be there. How do consultants sell? Again, most of these are self-explanatory, lack of preparation, so on, broken promises, bad attitudes, not delivering. Unkept appearance, self-explanatory. Um, the last one, chemistry, conflicting objectives, is very important because uh, their approach to things may be very different than yours. Uh, their attitude, their culture, and so on might be very different than yours. And, and if that's the case, um, odds are they're not, the quote, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to uh, implement your recommendations and so on. The last one actually um, is a typical place where consultants fail is they prescribe before they diagnose. I've got all the experience. I've done this a hundred times. You walk in the door and you're basically, in so many words, saying, I know what your problem is. It's X, Y, Z, and I know how to solve your problem. It's a little bit of ABC and DEF and so on. Think of it this way. If you didn't feel well and went to a doctor, sat in his office, doctor comes in, looks at you after he goes through three words of pleasantry, picks up a prescription pad, writes on it and says, I know what your problem is. Uh, take these pills and come back in two weeks and we'll see how you're doing. Question is, would you take those pills? I doubt it. What the doctor does do, the good doctor, is he asks you all kinds of questions. Where does it hurt? How long does it hurt? Uh, have you done this? Have you tried that? You know, and on and on down the list of 10, 15, whatever questions it might be. And after that, and maybe even after doing some sort of a diagnostic procedure, it could be as simple as lab work, he gives you a prescription. And in that situation, odds are you're going to take those meds and you're going to show up again in two weeks. Consultants should not prescribe before diagnosing. It is almost guaranteed failure because if for no other reason, the client has not bought into your solution. They will not believe in your solution. They will not want to implement your solution and essentially uh, will obviously not be a good reference for you down the road. All right, 10 steps to sharing, to starting a consultancy. Identify your niche, research target, target markets. Should take about 10 minutes. If you have good situation knowledge, which you need to have, Okay, you should be able to describe in three, four pages your market, your targets, and so on and so forth. If you can't do that, and it's going to take, quote, days to, to uh, put together a market analysis, if you will, might be referred to in a classic uh, business uh, plan, then you're probably in the wrong space. You need to get whatever cert certifications and licenses, uh, set short and long-term goals, Build a marketing plan, and the marketing plan is extremely important today, particularly as it relates to social media. All right? And it isn't just, I'm going to be on, on LinkedIn, I'm going to be on Facebook, I'm going to be uh, tweeting. What specifically are you going to do? What are you going to put in LinkedIn that makes me want to read your LinkedIn uh, blog and, and relate to uh, using you as a consultant? So you have to flesh this stuff out in bloody detail as much as you possibly can. You can't just put your name out there on your social website to expect that people are going to figure it all out. You need to lay out a sales strategy. The big question is how do you get to the decision makers? If you're selling $50,000 consulting projects or $500,000 consulting projects, who makes that decision in the organization? How do you get 
to that individual. You need to build and expand your network, professional associations, meetings, and so on and so forth. Can I overemphasize that? You need to be able to set your fees. We're going to talk about that in a minute. You're going to line up, you need to line up possible outsources. So you're going to do clinical consulting, but you might come across situations where you need financial expertise uh, or IT expertise. Line those people up beforehand. And of course, you need to land your first client. And quite honestly, if you're doing this as a startup or in a small firm, the first client should be a slam dunk. Uh, the people that you've worked with, done work for in other ways, uh, would normally be your first clients. The easiest clients you'll find you'll ever get are the first three clients that you do work for. After that, you got to really start selling. Those first three, they're already pre-sold. And of course, that first one or two is going to be hopefully your reference sites. We talk about hourly fees, the magic hourly fee. What do I charge? Before I get into that, remember consulting is a value buy. But here's the mechanics. Let's say you want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year minimum, you know, relative to what your salary would have been working for ABC company or healthcare, whatever. Well, there's roughly two thousand work hours in a year and fifty bucks an hour. Uh, that, that's your starting point. But in addition to your rate, income, income taxes, Social Security, etc., you must pay the employer part of Social Security, which is roughly 8%, pay for your own benefits, health, retirement, and so on. So if we increase the 50 by 8% plus another 25% for all those benefits, particularly health insurance, you get the 68 bucks an hour as a minimum billing rate. But we're not done yet. You're going to have downtime. The fact of the matter is you're not going to bill 2,000 hours in the first year. You're not going to bill 2,000 hours in the second, third, or fourth year because you're going to be out there selling. You're going to be out there marketing. You're going to have to stay self-educated. You're going to have to keep up on the industry, uh, industry trends. You may even want to take a vacation. And, of course, then again, you get that travel time to and from clients, uh, both to do projects and to sell projects. So if you can do 50%, what they call 50% utilization in the first year or any year, uh, that essentially means you're billable half time. So you take that 68 bucks, multiply it by two, you get $136 an hour. But even still, you've got 10% more for basic business expenses, the computer supplies, the phone, car, accounting, blah, blah, blah. Another 10%. You're at 150 bucks an hour. Okay. So if you're out there building yourself for 100 bucks an hour, in effect, you're losing money, so to speak. Now, somebody might say, well, wait a minute, I can get that billing right down because I'm going to work more as a consultant in terms of hours than I did for that rinky-dink uh, hospital I've been working for. Well, that's good. What are you going to do? You're going to work six hours a day, 10 hours a day, 10 hours a day, six days a week, 10 hours a day? Well, that's roughly 3,000 hours. And that will take your billing rate down to 100 bucks an hour. And you're going to eat all that time, which is fine if you're willing to do it. The thing is, you need to know that you're doing that. And you need to uh, think about how long are you going to be able to do that is extremely important. Uh, so, you know, you can get into the price war in terms of bidding consulting. But it, the reality is it comes out of your hide one way or the other. Remember, consulting is a value buy. Okay, 15 attributes of being a successful consultant. There they are. I'm not, I'm not going to read them all. Uh, it's fairly self-explanatory. You notice I have the plan B down here at the bottom. Uh, you know, communication skills, analytical ability, strong intellectual energy, and so on and so forth, self-starter, all fairly obvious. This is what you need to do if you are seriously considered going into consulting. Do a self-assessment. You score yourself on each attribute on a scale of zero to five. Zero is you got little competency. One is weak. Two, it needs work. Three is you're comfortable and familiar with it. Four, you're good at it. And five is it's one of your strongest competencies. Okay? You score yourself on the 15. The highest score, obviously, 75. If you score greater than 70, go for it. I mean, you're golden. I mean, you should be able to. You hit the ground running, so to speak. If you score between 60 and 70, you can do it. 
you're going to need to shore up some of those weaker points, but it's likely you could be successful. If you come in at 45 to 59, it's going to be a difficult climb. I suggest you go with a launcher or a mid-sized firm. If you're on the 45, my advice is stick to your current job, and maybe if you don't like your current job, start a search. And then, of course, my last advice here on this is if you have three or more deal breakers, forget about it. This is not for you. What are the deal breakers? Well, in that list, the starred items were high tolerance for risk, stress, and rejection. If that's not you, this ain't your ball game. Strong self-confidence. You have a can-do, you don't have a can-do attitude, do it all, no task too small. Self-starter, fast learner. If you do not have two or three of these, don't do it, is my advice. You're going to find it to be your month in hell or whatever. So, last word on consulting. There you have it. You are now done. It's your turn. I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Frank. Um, as he mentioned, now we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, the first question, uh, this person started to do some consulting, took on a project, and now sees that they aren't charging enough. Is there anything that they can do now to increase it? And what if it's not this project, but a follow-up project? You know, that's a typical situation when somebody starts out, um, you know, they, they underprice themselves. Uh, either they don't realize the formula, if you will, uh, or they uh, uh, get in a competitive situation, perhaps, or quite simply, the, the, the firm that's hiring them realizes that they're new to the game and they're going to try to get it on a, on a sweetheart deal, if you will. Uh, my advice is if it's a small project, go ahead and finish it, you know, and just learn from it. If it's uh, part of a much larger project, uh, then I would uh, look at that project and see if I could find a, a break point. Uh, and at that break point, bring it up with a client and, and just be honest and say, look, I, I underpriced myself. Uh, I can't keep doing it at this rate. Um, I need a rate of X plus Y. Here are the reasons why. And I'm hoping you can, you know, see ourselves to, to do that. Um, they, if, you, if it's that small project and you finish it, they come back with a second project, which is obviously good. Then clearly at that point, you should uh, own up and so to speak and say, look, when I was doing this for 50 bucks an hour and, um, I can't keep doing it this way. I did the first one for you real, real inexpensive because I, I needed the experience and, and I, I like the project and so on and so forth. But henceforth, the billing rate is going to be, uh, you know, X plus Y or whatever you want. But that's that would be my advice. Make sure as heck don't keep billing yourself out at that, uh, you know, low ball rate. All right. Thank you. Um, the next one. What are your thoughts about keeping your full-time job and doing freelance work on the side? Is that a safer way to start? Well, um, it's a safer way, but what you usually find uh, in situations like this is uh, that full-time job or, or uh, is going to, you know, still take up a good deal of your time, if not all your time, and you're going to be squeezing. The consulting work in, and you know, if it doesn't require any travel time, uh, it's more workable. And if you can do, you know, do most of your stuff over the internet, that, that's okay. Uh, but I'd only do that for a short period of time. I, I would say, you know, you want to do that, do it for no more than a year, uh, and then at the end of that year, make a decision whether you're going to do this full time or not. Uh, because it'll simply get to the point where you'll probably burn out if you keep trying to do both. And most likely, uh, the consulting work, uh, if you're good at what you're doing and you'll get referrals and so on, is going to take away from your full-time job. And it's just a matter of time before your current employer 
figures out that you're not uh, quite putting in as enough, as enough, enough hours. Um, Michael would like to know if you can talk a little bit about the pros and cons of working for a mid-sized consulting firm as an employee versus a contractor on an interim basis. Uh, well, I mean, uh, this, in, in the simple world, uh, as an employee, you get benefits, obviously, so the, the employer is paying for all those benefits. Um, you know, I, I would also say that... Um, if you work for a mid-sized firm or a large firm, uh, you're going to work a lot of hours. There's no question about it. I mean, uh, these organizations, you know, will, will suck up every hour you have if you let them do it. Uh, so the positive side of, of being independent is is you say, I'm going to put in 100 hours into this project or 1,000 hours, whatever it might be, and that's it. I mean, you know, you do the project, you put in your 1,000 hours, and if they want more hours, whether they be you know, on Saturdays or in the middle of the night, they're paying for those hours. You work for a large firm or mid-sized firm, you might find yourself working at midnight, but your salary doesn't change. Now, a lot of those firms, the mid-sized firms, larger firms, and even some of the smaller ones, have bonus programs. Um, you know, so if if your billable hours maintain a certain level, 60% or whatever it might be, you'll get a bonus at the end of the year. So you'll, you'll rec recoup some of that. Um, whether or not it, it, it's not necessarily better, it's it, if you're if you're new to consulting and you do that analysis that I gave you, uh, a mid-sized to larger firm is might be your better cup of tea to get into consulting. So there's an advantage there. Um, if you go uh, and just do contract work, uh, you're you're essentially on your own. And if you're not um, familiar with doing that, you know, there could be problems there. All right. We have time for one more question. Uh, this person is about to start consulting, but they don't have any value or reference stories to begin with. So what are your suggestions about what they can do? Well, the example I gave, and, and I think the, the words I use were, uh, Cell consulting, you know, the reference story, the value story is very important. You should have as many of those as you can muster up. Um, and they can come from previous consulting work. But if you've not done consulting before, you should be able to write value stories um, from the work you've done and in the, in the jobs that you've been in. So if you're a um, applications programmer uh, at a hospital, for example, you've been there five or seven years or whatever it is, you should be able to come up with a series of stories uh, of projects that you worked on where you, in so many words, made a difference, where you brought value to the situation, where you made some changes, got some things done, maybe reoriented the project, whatever it might be, uh, that could be translated into value statements. So um, if you're going to start a consultancy, and let's assume for the sake of discussion, it's in the security area, uh, the assumption is you've done some security work in your full-time job. Uh, you know, what value stories can you put together from your day-to-day -day work uh, in the area of security that you would then use as a basis to go out to a prospective client and say, uh, you've got this security problem. When I was working at Hospital X or Vendor Y, uh, we had a similar situation. Here's how I dealt with it. Here's what we did. Here's how we solved the problem. Is what the benefits were. So value stories aren't just simply because you've done consulting before. They, they transcend all the jobs you've been in. Great. Thank you. Um, that was our last question. So this concludes the webinar. Thank you, attendees, for joining us today. And thank you, Frank, for taking the time to prepare and present such a great webinar for the HIS Talk uh, audience. As a reminder to attendees, watch your email for links to the recording of today's webinar as well as the PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.